you very much, Dennis. Um, well, this poem uh, has the advantage of posing a number of broad questions about, about literature, about its reception, uh, its public function, uh, the role of authorial intention, and uh, about critical models that work in professional discussions of, of poems. And I'm, interest, I'm especially interested in the implicit models that work in uh, the production and reception of, of lyric poetry. In this case, um, uh, particularly interesting are conceptions of the relation of poetry to, to truth and how this poem can relate to those conceptions. Um, for lyric poets, poetry, uh, critics often subscribe to Sir Philip Sidney's dictum, uh, now for the poet, he nothing affirmeth and therefore never lieth. But Auden famously rejected this poem because he thought it, thought it lied. Um, as you probably know, after first publishing the poem in the New Republic in October 1939, uh, and then in his 1940 collection, uh, Another Time, um, for his collected poems in 1945, he dropped the whole stanza containing the famous line, we must love one another or die. And in 1964, he wrote, um, rereading the poem of mine, September 1st, 1939, after it had been published, I came to the line, we must love one another or die, and said to myself, that's a damned lie. We must die anyway. <laughs> so in the next edition, I altered it to, we must love one another and die. But that didn't seem to do either. So, so I cut the stanza. Still no good. Uh, the whole poem, I realized, was infected with an incurable dishonesty and must be scrapped. So Auden seems convinced that lyrics uh, can lie and that his, his did. But now, the dominant model of the lyric, at least in Anglo-American pedagogy, is that of the short personal utterance uh, by a persona who is not to be confused or not identified with the author. And students are trained to treat uh, the speaker as a character, ask what speech act he or she is performing, uh, and what would make someone speak thus and feel thus. The poem is a, is a drama of attitudes to which Sidney's dictum can well apply. We don't ask whether what the poem says is true or whether statements in the poem are true, but why someone would speak thus and feel thus. Now, Auden's poem certainly could be read this way. I mean, it gives us a first-person speaker in a particular situation on a given date using that present tense that is the surest mark of the lyric, I sit in one of the dives. So, Hence, that has almost no other use in English, right? Um, and one could trace the drama of attitudes beginning with, beginning uncertain and afraid in stanza one, diagnosing what has driven the culture mad uh, in stanza two, the disruption of the euphoric dream in stanza four, uh, recognition of our collective guilt. Uh, we are lost in a haunted wood, children afraid of the night who have never been happy or good and we suffer that error bred in the bone of each woman and each man, uh, that craving not just for, for universal love, but to be loved alone. So is there any hope, this speaker asks, and the problem then shifts from us to them, uh, the dense commuters, the sensual, sensual man in the street in stanzas seven and eight. Um, who can release them now? Uh, who can reach the deaf? Who can speak for the dumb? The speaker has only a voice which, with which he can attempt to participate in the exchange of messages among the just who are scattered, uh, scattered across the world. May I, composed like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. So one can read the poem for the drama of attitudes it displays, but that's certainly not how Auden took it, nor is it how readers after 9-11 seem to have taken it. That's certainly ironic that a poem which Auden disowned has become his, probably his most famous. But, uh, and you recall, as, as Ian mentioned, that after the attack on the World Trade Center, the poem was uh, cited in the media, uh, on the web, frequently emailed. Um, the, uh, uh, to among friends, etc. Um, the uh, I think it's above all the coincidence between the aftermath of the terrorist attack uh, and some of the poem's references: the the September date, the Manhattan location, uh, the waves of anger and fear that circulate, 
uh, the reference in stanza four to the blind skyscrapers in their, in their full height, uh, the defenseless stupor, uh, defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies in stanza five. But I think above all, the fact that as the opening stanza puts it, the unmentionable odor of death offends the September night. These convergences led readers to take this poem as particularly apt, particularly true. Uh, Daniel Swift wrote in the TLS that as New York explains the bombing to itself, Auden's words are everywhere. And MSNBC reported, in the wake of September 11th, 2001, many have turned to one poem in particular in search of understanding and insight. It was thought to embody some sort of, some sort of truth. So, in fact, the poem, both for author and readers, seemed to function according to a very different model from that by which re re lyrics are frequently read in the academic circumstances, not as a dramatic monologue, um, but as, um, if we're looking for another name for, for it, for what might be called epideictic uh, discourse, a, a classical model whereby poetry, the role of poetry is to persuade listeners concerning what is worthy of praise or blame, or to recommend to them attitudes and offer truths about experience. In Plato's Protagoras, it's said that the principal part of education is learning to distinguish what in the sayings of poets is correct and what is not, and explain the reason for the difference. And everyone sort of assumes that it's fine to argue about a poem of Simonides and whether what it says is true, true or not. So Socrates dissents, thinking people should not argue about poems, but should argue about philosophy and dialectic. But epideictic verses can see be seen as a ver some ver a version of, well, in effect, uh, uh, lyric with a choral function in which words are offered for repetition uh, by readers or, or singers. And this seems to be how, in effect, how Auden and his modern audience took the poem as, declare, as declaring supposed truths, including we must love one another or die, giving us lines to repeat and reflect on. Now, for me, what's especially appealing about the poem is the, the subtler claim that even uh, the windiest militant trash uh, that important person spout is not so crude as our deep wish, which Auden had just been reading about in Nijinsky's diary, that uh, Diaghilev craved not, not just universal love, but to be loved alone, that this, this crazed wish to be loved, be loved by everyone and to be the only one who is in fact as the poem says, true of the normal heart, that it's bred in, bred in the bone of each woman and each man. Now, this would not be very significant if it's simply the momentary at a view of a persona. It's vastly more interesting as a claim about the world, uh, as a truth claim, and not as an attitude momentarily adopted during the in, a, in a sequence of drama of attitudes. But having said this, it's important to acknowledge two things. First, that um, Though readers went to this poem in large numbers because it, they thought it told them something true and relevant, it's obviously the case that they found it compelling because it was poetry, not, because it's not just some political or ethical statement telling us, uh, condemning dictators and telling us that we should love one another, uh, we should love one another. I mean, there are lots of such statements about. And, uh, but because as a poem, it seems to have a quite independent existence, so that when it then seems suddenly to apply, actually apply to a given situation, that is, that is striking, it's unexpected, reason enough to email it to a friend. Um, it, seems to me, it seems to me hard to overestimate the importance of this sense of the independence or autonomy of the poem. Um, so despite the singular date that marks it as testimony, it has the solidity of a piece of independent uh, crafted language, uh, of telling formulations, uh, and I think especially with that trimeter which seems stately and deliberative, um, I think partly because uh, the deep default structure of English verse is tetrameter, so that trimeter seems to call for a pause at the end of each line, as Dennis Donahue usually uh, provided when he was reading it. You know, into the neutral air where blind skyscrapers use their full height to proclaim, 
uh, etc. We go, we have a, a, an effect, a virtual be beat at the end of each trimeter line. Each, even when there's a strong enjambment, each language pours its vein of, of competitive excuse. So even where there is that strong enjambment, one tends to pause rather than move straight on, as would be more logical. And the occasional rhymes and half rhymes in each 11 line stanza may reinforce that tendency to pause, which uh, helps give the poem its solidity and solemnity. So there's that one point. Second point, um, though readers valued the poem for the truths or understanding it offered, including that of its most famous line, we must love one another or die, it's striking that what this poem proclaims as a more elemental truth, um, the unknown to everyone in the second stanza, I and the public know what all school children learn, those to whom evil is done do evil in return. This was a truth not allowed to enter public discourse. Anyone who dared suggest such a thought, um, uh, much less suggests that we should look at ourselves in the mirror and consider our complicity, as the poem reports. Out of the mirror they stare imperialism's face and the international wrong, very potentially very relevant to this case, of course. Anyone who articulated such views was treated as a, as a pariah. The poem was not taken to assert that we have committed an international wrong, which has come back to haunt us. So, so though the poem was taken to articulate truths and valued for that, it nonetheless was not received as an argument. So it's as though poems are seen as buffets of truth, where you can pick what you want to consume, whereas in a prose argument, you would at least need to confront the various claims. Um, I think the sentence from Whitman that Sharon Cameron quoted a few moments ago uh, functions in much the same way. You pick the, you pick the truth that you want from that, from that for formulation, and you can ignore some of the others. So perhaps one function of epideictic poetry of this sort is to tell truths, some of which work only subliminally, do not require assent or descent. They can be uh, assimilated as if they were not articulated, but were only part of the fabric of the poetic act. Um, there's a wonderful book by uh, Stephen Booth, now largely neglected, called Precious Nonsense, which uses, Booth starts with examples of nursery rhymes to illustrate what he calls poem's ability to let us understand something that does not make sense as if it did make sense. So we seem to take pleasure in accepting nonsense, he writes, as sense is usual among us. Perhaps those were happier times, so if you could count on the usual, that sense was usual among them. And he, but he cites the jingle, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. It's an example, one for the money. I mean, what's that about? We, we don't understand this at all. Um, what's the attraction that makes this memorable? The, certainly the most salient feature of this jingle, which we never notice, but which is absolutely blatant once attention is called to it, is the strange collision of irrelevant numbers in each line. One, four, the money, two, four, the show, three, two, get ready, and then four, two, go, one, two, one, four, two, four, three, two, four, two. I mean, this collision, however unintelligible, must be part of its attraction. And Booth writes, what does the human mind ordinarily want most? It wants to understand what it does not understand. And what does the human mind customarily do to achieve this goal? It works away, sometimes for only a second or two, sometimes for years, until it understands. What does the mind have then? What it wanted? No. What it, what it has is understanding of something that it now understands. What it wanted was to understand something that it did not understand. <laughs> so poems in giving us the impression of the, the rightness of what we don't understand, or the sense that we now control what we don't understand, have the ability, Booth writes, to free us from the limits of the human mind. So that's a little bit of analogy. I think something like that maybe it must be at work here, that we're operating in a mode of truth, not the fictional mode of the dramatic monologue, um, by a persona, but the seductions of poetic form enable us to avoid explicitly engaging some assertions, or having to, or to take another example from the poem, or having to cope with the incoherence of the relations between the I, the we, and the they in this poem. I mean, much of the power of this poem comes from the eye's explicit implication in the we who are complicitous with evil or, or wrong, who, who seek not just universal love, but to be loved alone. 
Uh, but the poem also draws power from the satirical treatment of the dense commuters and, uh, and, and uh, these, these other they, the, uh, uh, the central man in the street, who is treated as blind and deaf, though it offers no, expla and though it offers no explanation. I mean, it can't, I would say, one can't offer a just an explanation of where the just, who pop up with a capital letter uh, in the final lines, where those the just come from. So these wonderful final lines, I will, I will emphasize, um, encapsulate that unresolved contradiction. May I, composed like them of eros and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. So composed like them seems like we are all in this together as composed only of eros and, and of dust, but in fact, of course, grammatically, that um, the them in that sentence is the just and not everybody. So as Booth says, poem has an ability to let us understand something that does not make sense as if it did make sense. I wonder how far this is the secret of its power. Thanks.